Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of uh, Field Development and Operations. So I want to start uh, the lecture. Let's see if it's recording. Okay, I want to start today's lecture by just doing a brief um, summary of what we you saw last, uh, last week. Okay, so last week we had two lectures. One of them was by Professor Golan, Michael Golan, and he was talking a bit about how to deal with uncertainty in uh, the field development uh, phase, and also sometimes we have to deal with uncertainty in the operational phase. But his part was mainly focused on the field development phase. So he was addressing the particular case, and you saw that we did that with uh, uh, prob probabilistic tools, okay? And that means the particular case that he was um, that he was addressing was that you have you want to calculate a number, you want to calculate total recoverable reserves, okay? And that was the hydrocarbon, uh, the the volume of the formation, volume of the rock, times the porosity, times one minus the water saturation. Initially, we're assuming that there is only there is no gas cap, there is only oil. And then you have the net to gross volume. Let's put NTG. That divided by the volume, uh, formation volume factor of oil. And that times the recovery factor, ultimate recovery factor. So the thing is that usually for all of these parameters, which number to put? In a deterministic approach, you just have one value. You are have one value, you are sure that that value is the correct one and then you introduce it and you just compute from here you compute only one number how much it can recover from the reservoir we can call that NPU or GPU or in a generic as I told you GPU but in truth we don't have one unique value for each one of the, <coughs> the, the elements in this equation at a very early stage we have just an approximate okay we have in the in the in the general way, we have a minimum and we have a maximum. We have a range. It can be between these two values. And you also saw that depending on the, on the kind of measurements that we have, on the amount of tests that we have available on all of these, okay? So let's put here. It's possible to, to characterize, not just to have a minimum and a maximum, but also to characterize with a probability function how is that value distributed, okay? Like for example, the volume, you can say, okay, we have no idea really how the volume, how big the volume is. So we can put just a rectangular distribution and then we say that any value in between this minimum and maximum has the same probability of a curve, of occurrence, okay? While then it comes to porosity, we have a minimum and a maximum, but we are sure, for example, that it should be close to, let's say, 0.3. Okay, we said that this is 0.3. Then for water saturation, then we are not so sure, but we know it should be around closer to the lower bound. Okay. So this to take into account all of these uh, variations. So to take into so. If you choose only one value and then you compute the, the, in this case, our function, which is total recoverable reserve, okay, that's called a deterministic analysis. And that's when you don't have any uncertainty on the values, on the input values that that equation is using, that that uh, expression is using. But when you have uncertainty, you have to deal with the pro probabilistic approach. Okay, so let's try to finish that. And at the end, of course, what we want to do is to comp compound all of these values, and we want to obtain, this one was missing, and we want to obtain um, also a function, a probability, um, a probability distribution function and a cumulative distribution function of the total recoverable reserves. Okay. 
So that's what you have seen uh, last class. And then you saw a method to calculate that, to take all of that into account. That was, how was the name of the method? Monte Carlo method, okay. Yeah, you take, you take, um, you know that each one of these variables is represented by a distribution and you also can express a certain value has a random, with a random number between zero and one. So you had an expression, you put any random number between zero and one, and that's going to give you a value, for example, of the volume of the rock between this minimum and this maximum, following also this probability distribution, okay? One thing that was missing from last class was the, how many iterations do we have to make, okay? So for that, I'm going to upload, uh, Professor Glan gave me uh, a set of notes. So how do you determine how many iterations you have to run? And that depends on how accurate you want your Monte Carlo simulation to be, okay? And usually for a 2%, so that's the expression. The standard deviation of the, of the results divided by the average. So you just, um, in, in uh, I think he was doing an example in class, right? And he was setting that upper number of iterations. Also, we, you're going to have an exercise, and I'm giving you also this number, but you know where this number came from. If I want to reduce the error, that means I want to increase the confidence in my, in my calculations, so I, I want to increase the number of iterations. So I'm going to paste that on the notes. So in order to, so that was done using that Monte Carlo simulation. And I think I'm not, I think that was, um, that method was developed by um, a person in a physicist, I think working in the Man Manhattan project, I think. So you can go on Wikipedia and check all the information. So we do that using Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, yeah, also one comment that I want to make here is that usually this, uh, this function, when we have, When we have one variable, maybe we are not very sure. We have very little information. I'm, I'm, I think that also uh, Mike told you about this, uh, that at, at the beginning of the project, you don't have a lot of information, but you have to take a lot of decisions. I think he gave you, he showed you this figure, okay? You have to, you have to, it's the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. You have very few information. If this is, we call information. And this is decisions that we have to make. Okay. So at the beginning of the project, we have very little information. And then based on that, we have to make a lot of decisions. Okay. But when time passes, we are getting more and more information. But then anytime I'm restricted or I'm constrained to a system that is already uh, selected. So we can say that's a time axis. So if we put that in terms of some kind of function, also probability function, that means that initially I'm at an early time, I have a very wide distribution. You have a center, but more or less anything can happen in between, right? So this is at very early time. And as time passes, you really see that you're able to narrow that gap. until ideally I'm able to close the uncertainty and be very sure that it's almost around, it has to be very close or around a certain value, okay? One thing that I, I would like to comment is also about, uh, was also about, um, about experience or about how the, the knowledge also of the person and the experience of the person working in projects also plays an important role. It's like you put a you put a an, a an elder engineer and a senior engineer to to tell you to give me a probability distribution, for example, for porosity or also for um, for uh, saturation. Okay, and this young engineer is going to give you this distribution, and at the end maybe the final distribution is something like this. Okay, so the guy was a bit a bit off. So that also plays a big role about the experience of the engineer, about the experience of the person saying, defining the probabilistic function to use to that these values at the end will be as close as possible.
okay? The peak or the center, the most probable value of the initial distribution that I'm using, I'm using will be very close to the final value or the real value that that parameter has. Okay. So we talked about that, okay? Last, or is, yeah, uh, Golan talked about that last class. Because there is some, um, hmm? yep. If you are using the deterministic approach, mm -hmm. and for example, for the high, if you are calculating the high estimate of the dissolver reserve, so we will be using the low estimate of the like coarse water saturation. Well, you you have to run you you have to get a curve. Okay, it's not that you get a single value. No, for the deterministic. Okay. For the deterministic, that's not used. Uh, that's why you don't want to use the deterministic approach. Okay, I will show you later. There is something called a spider plot where you can take into account only by using minimum and maximum. You can say more or less what will be the variation of these parameters. Okay, but that's not, not useful. Doesn't tell you anything to take a, a kind of a proper decision. All the time, if there is a lot of uncertainty in the values, you choose to go to perform a Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. Okay. And for example, if you are using the uniform distribution for all the parameters. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the NPV, so the recoverable reserve, we get, if we make a distribution for the recoverable reserve, it will be uniform no. distribution. No. no. Depends on the on the equation that we are using. So if okay. you're using the uniform distribution for the all, all of the parameters for all the water saturation. But that the depends on the equation that you have. For example, if it's a summation, I think then you obtain a, okay. as also a uniform distribution. But in this case, we have a multiplication and we have also a division, so that also plays a role. It's not only the, the distribution of each individual parameter in the equation, but it's also the equation that you're using. Okay. And uh, uh, here, we are only considering the, the uncertainty in the recoverable reserve, not in the cost in the cap capex of x. Yeah, we will discuss cost later in the lecture. Uh, something else to note, okay, so Monte Carlo simulation, and I'm going to paste here, just in between these slides, I'm going to paste uh, the maximum number of iterations. Um, okay, so the next... Um, Okay, so the next topic that was on Thursday, we you were also, you had a, we had a guest lecture from Sevan Marie that he was telling you a bit more about field development in the offshore projects, okay? And uh, one very important thing that he mentioned is that to, that you have to, you have also, he said to, what, what we are going to discuss a bit later today is about the NPV, that you have to evaluate the NPV of the, the different alternatives, that you have to take into account uncertainty, but also he talked that also the attributes have a lot of weight in your decision on your selection of your field development option. I'm not sure if you rem remember, but at the end of the lecture, he said that one option had greater NPV than another, but he said we cannot take the decision only based on this factor. We have many other factors that we have to take into account. So one of them was that he called he attribute level. Okay. And this attribute level, he said that they might be things that we have, for example, he said certain production system might be uh, sooner, ready sooner than another one. Okay, so that's an advantage for our project. It might be more flexible than others to scale in the future. But that, those kind of things, they are a bit difficult. At the end, what we want to have is not only a bunch of words or a bunch of advantages and disadvantages, but we try to put that all in that quantitative way. Okay, so the, like the approach that he showed, how that's typically done. Okay, so that's more or less what I already showed you. Okay, was to assign a scale how important is it for you, or how important, how relevant is it for the project that you had the scale from zero to one, if you remember, and he said uh, flexibility, or he had something, uh, uh, existing experience, chance of delay, and you had a scale from zero to one. And then at the end, he tried to compound all of these factors, or all of these questions in a number. And this number, you do it with these weight numbers. How important is one thing for the company, or how, how important is another thing for the company, okay? 
And of course, like you can imagine, this depends very much on what the company is using or what is the experience with the company. Can sometimes, if there is not a universal method, and these weight factors depend very much on each company, and some companies actually don't use this at all. They just depend on their experience with existing systems, and they just prefer, we have worked with this kind of system for a long time, so we are going just to continue with a particular type of system. So this will be how to, if we can put it in a phrase, to say how to quantify or how to assign a qualitative, qu quantitative value to an attribute. They call it attribute. But actually, there are some other things that are not captured by, for example, total recoverable reserves or by NPV or some things that are outside but can also play a bigger role in our decision. And as you saw, I want just to make the comment that as you saw, it's a very complicated project. He was foc It's a very complicated process. He showed you or he was focusing mainly on the offshore part and that the offshore part plays a big role. But you saw that it has a lot of different elements. So I'm not trying here on this course, I'm not trying just to give you a checklist what you have to do in order to do a field development plan. That changes very much from company to company. And the amount of studies that you need, you see that some things are done by the company just to get a better estimation and just to have a better tools for the decision. But some things are things that are asked or are demanded by the government and are demanded by the partners, are demanded by anyone that is putting money. There are some just some regulations that you have to fulfill. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to distill all of these things. But the idea really of this course is to give you tools in each one, to give you an overview of the whole process, and then to give you tools in each one of the process, very simplified, okay, maybe we are not using at the complexity that the people are using in the company, but you know more or less the fundamentals, and then you can tackle bigger and more complicated problems. Okay, that's the main purpose of the course. Yeah, so I here I have a figure that I forgot to mention that is, for example, the Okay, related with this time, the evolution of uncertainty in the value, okay, in the evolution of, of uncertainty with time. Okay, and here we have a forecast, okay, we have uh, for the next uh, seven days or something of the temperature, how the temperature is going to be in Trondheim. And you see that also when we look further into the future, there is a lot of uncertainty. But we, we are progressing, of course, tomorrow we will know exactly what the temperature was. Okay. Values closer to the, to the present, they will have less uncertainty than values in the future, longer in the future. So that's a bit related with that figure that I was showing before. And that's related with this figure that I was showing before. Okay, with time, you have all the time more and more information, but uh, at the same time, and you have less and less uncertainty. So the uncertainty will be also the opposite, decisions and uncertainty. Okay, um, so we are going to have Based on the today's class and based on the class of the last two weeks, we are of the last week, we are going to have um, an exercise. Okay, I have already almost finished. I will hope I hope to publish it by tomorrow. That you will have to do an uh, evaluation of concepts. You have to do one exercise about total recoverable reserves, taking into account uncertainty, and you have also to um, to do uh, NPV calculations for two options to to develop a field, an offshore field. By the way, any comments about the exercise? Any question that you had after now you you were doing the exercise? No? Everything was clear? Yeah? Um, can you uh, show us how to solve the problem 3.2 solar? The problem? OK, 
Okay, any question on this? So we go maybe one by one. Any question on the first problem? I think this problem, uh, the right amount of whales was three. You have to have at least three whales, okay? And here I have to say also very important that you see, I think some people estimated and they say you need 2.2 whales. If you have just 20% or one whale could produce 20% more, you don't need to drill another whale, okay? So you could use, so one thing that you could recommend and that's also encourage, you know, yeah, I give you the, the homework, but it's also all the time I encourage you to put something extra, okay? If you want to do extra calculations, if you want to challenge the, da the data that I'm giving you, or you want to go beyond the exercise, that will be great, okay? You have to do some, these are kind of the basic fundamental things that you have to do to deliver, but also I encourage you to, to, if you want, and if you have the interest, to give something extra. So one thing was that how can you, to avoid this third well that maybe is more expensive, okay, it's, be, it's most expensive for my project, maybe how can I live with two wells? So in that case, I have to increase a bit the, the production from, from the wells, okay? I have to increase the potential that I can get from these wells. And we will see that later in a different section, production enhancement techniques. But basically you have to make it uh, easier for the fluid to flow from the formation to the separator. Okay, and you have many techniques for that. You can improve the flow through the formation, so you can do some treatment, you can do a stimulation, you can do fracking, you can do, uh, you can do things also in the well, maybe you can increase a bit the size, okay? ESP. You can put, well, if it's a gas well, then we cannot use ESP, yeah. okay? So we can put, for example, a compressor in the wellhead, but all of these measures, you have to have some other parameter to evaluate how good they are, because it's not good that, for example, you put a bigger well or you drill a bigger, bigger well, you do a stimulation, and at the end the cost will be the same that like to drill an additional well, okay? So the economical part is very important. But in this case, I think was something close to, um, uh, yeah, three wells have to be at least. Then uh, this problem, uh, I think that was very straightforward from the, from the classes, but I think it uh, was something like five or seven years for the highest plateau rate then you have something like 10 or 12 maybe for the second and the third plateau rate was like 17 okay, or 20. You should have something like that. Then this problem was a bit trickier because it had two reservoirs. Okay, and I think uh, here the plateau was something like close to five years when you, and it was because the Safra, I think was entering into decline and Sumac never entered into decline. Is that what you get, more or less? Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, and the API, I think, was after six years, something like that, that it began to violate the, the requirement. So how in that case, if you're already promising, just one question out of the exercise, if you're already promising a, an oil of a certain characteristics, how will you deal with the fact that now you have an API less than, less than promised? How can how can you take it up to a standard? You can mix if you have another assets, and that's a very important fact. If you're, uh, for example, a national oil company that you have some other assets, you can try to do blending of a higher API crude to get to increase the API of that oil that you're supposed to sell. Okay? Because some things, if you sell with a lower API, maybe they won't accept. They want to pay you less for this oil, or maybe they even don't accept at all because some refineries, they just have a limit on the API that they can handle. Okay? If they go below certain value, they're just going to reject the crude. So that might be one, one option. Uh, okay, so the other thing was to, okay, s the question was to, um, to, if you want to change now the splitting, okay, we still want to produce 170,000 barrels from the fuel, but now we want to change, we saw that SUMAC lasts for a long time, even, you know, after I think 10, 12 years, but Safra is finishing the plateau very quickly. So we want to use that to our advantage, and we also saw that the API is higher at the beginning. Okay, it's much higher, I think it's two degrees API higher. So what you have to do here, you will see that if you reach, if you take it all the way to the limit, okay, that you want the API to be exactly 31.8, then you will get a plateau, I think it was like six years something like that, 6.4, okay? 
but you cannot go below below than that because then you will have the API will fall below specs in the plateau period. Okay. Then the optimal up uptake or the up the optimal rate that you have to produce from each field. Really, when when do you maximize plateau length if you're producing from two reservoirs? When they go into decline. When they go into decline at the same time. Okay, so you have to find exactly the splitting that gives you the same plateau uh, duration. Okay. Well, there are kind all kind of tricks you can use solver. You can use those people that are good with equations. They can just find it from the equations. Okay. The um, Okay, you have that rate from SUMAC and rate from SAFHA. They have to be equal to 170,000 barrels. And you want to say that the plateau duration is the same. So you have to um, GP for SUMAC divided by Q of SUMAC times number of days in a year has to be equal to GP Sapha divided by Q Sapha plateau Sapha times the number of days in a year and then you can substitute the equation remember that we have one equation from Sapha and one equation for sumac for the potential as a function of the QPP of sumac Sumac and Sapha. That's only one 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 approach how I will do it. But if anyone, you know, maybe using solver, maybe using any other approach is valid. But the, the point is that the two of them have to the plateau has to end at the same time to maximize plateau. Okay. So you substitute these two equations here. And then you have two equations with two unknowns, and you solve it. And then from there, you find uh, the rate, how much each reservoir has to produce in the plateau, plateau rate. Okay. That's exercise three point, I think it was three, three. right? This slide says that they are three of the linear equations, mm -hmm. equal to zero. But all of them were unknown, and this Maybe you were missing this equation. But you have two unknowns here, and then you have two unknowns here. So you you should be able to solve it too. Okay, and so one question, any more questions about that exercise? No? Can I ask you? Yep. For uh, the second part of question three, can we just do the weighted average uh, rather than using the mass flow rate and so on? Yeah, I think I mentioned to use the weight average, I think. Mass weight average. Yeah, you, but uh, again, it's just like constant multiplied by uh, the API. So we can use the API as it is instead of finding the volume and the mass rate. And yeah, well, yeah, well, that would you have to try for yourself. Is it the same to do uh, AP weight average or uh, density weight average? It be Is it the same? Okay, well, we leave that like uh, homework. Okay, and the third, uh, the third example, um, some people were suggesting to use, uh, one comment here, one people was suggesting to use a uh, subsea uh, peak launcher. Okay. We said that option when you want to have only one line, okay, and also when the distance is very long. Okay, when the, in this case, the distance is relatively close. It's 10 kilometers. That's quite a uh, standard distance from the wells to the FPSO or from the manifolds to the FPSO. So in that case, it really doesn't pay because, as I told you, to launch a peak offshore is quite quite a big F, quite a big uh, work. Okay, and actually, I don't know if there is any system here in the North Sea installed currently. I know that they are in the Australia, for example, but I'm not sure of any North Sea subsea peak launcher. So in that case, when the distance is so close, it doesn't pay to install that and to have to mobilize a rig every time that you want to launch a peak, just to have two lines from the platform. Okay. 
and the rest I think we have covered already in class so this was kind of a any question on that? No? Oh, there was also um, the line that you're going to connect. You know that you have to have the well, okay? And so that's problem four. You have to have the well, and then you have here the manifold, and you have two lines, okay? One goes to the production, and one goes to the test separator. How we connected that in class was we took a line from the well, only one line, and then we took it to the production line, or then we took a derivative line, and then we connected to the test line. Okay. I saw some deliveries that they just put two lines from the well, okay, like if it had two jumpers. Okay. That usually, if I already have a line entering into the manifold, that's reducing the number of interfaces. The manifold has only one interface with the well, and the well from the well you have only one line if you want to connect another line parallel line then that's increasing the complexity with no no need for that in this case I will have to install two jumpers or two flow lines from the well to the manifold a bit more complicated okay any more questions yes Well, you just put it here like we, s we explained in class. You have one line, okay? You disconnect the production separator and you connect the peak launcher. You put the peak launcher, actually uh, we have another line here, and we connect it to a pump. Yeah. Then you ins close this valve, put the peak inside, then open this valve and begin to pump. Okay, then you have the peak going all the way through the line, and here you have that is part of the manifold. You have the peak going, all of these valves are closed, the peak goes back, and then goes, and it doesn't go to the test separator, but you have another <coughs> peak receiver, okay? Yeah. You can see an animation. I think I put a link of a YouTube video where you could see exactly how the, the equipment looks like, okay? But you launch and receive from the same place, all of that, all of this is in the FPSO. Why? Because we have access. Here you can have actually an engineer that he's sitting here and he's opening the equipment, he's looking at the valve, he's looking at what comes out, okay, what kind of garbage comes here, what's happening with the peak when I put it in. Okay. When I have it subsea, a lot of other issues that we have, we have to do everything remotely. Yes. Uh, in the first call, there was a question uh, made the point of, uh, uh, of an arrangement where each well has uh, its own workspace. Mm -hmm. on, uh, it was not unclear for me. Do we like, make them in parallel? I mean, the each, uh, for each well, we have a test line and production line, and we will put the workspace lower on this uh, test line as well. Or do we make them? Well, if you have already a multi-phase, the whole purpose of the, if you don't have to do pigging, okay, because I think that was part of the question, you don't have to do any pigging on the line. So you don't need two lines. And if you're measuring with the multi-phase meter, so you don't need, there is no justification for having two lines, okay? You can have only one. So there is one line that goes to the platform. And the multi-phase meter, you can, um, so you have one line that goes to this manifold, and you have one valve. So the multi-phase meter, you have two options with your knowledge that you have so far. You can put it either in the wellhead. You, if you remember, that was almost like a self-contained template. Okay, the, that's not that's not just a point or just not just not just the well. That's a whole structure that is housing the well. Okay, so you can put it either in the same structure. You put here the multi-phase flow meter, and even if you want to add robustness, you can say that you can put an option either to produce to the multi-phase meter. I think it's a bit bigger. Okay. 
Okay, here you have your multiphase meter, or you can decide if to skip to bypass the multiphase meter. Okay. So that will be, in that case, will be a part of the Christmas tree. It will be a whole part of the well, the, the multiphase meter. If you have enough money, if you know that each well is going to pay at least for you to buy a multiphase meter for that well. Okay. If, they will, if you are a, each well is very poor, or you are a relatively cost-saving company, so in that case you don't do this arrangement, and you put a multiphase meter, the option of a multiphase meter here on the, on the manifold. And then it's a multiphase meter that every well can use and be tested in a, in a kind of in a periodic basis. So here we say this can be connected to this line or it can be connected through the same multiphase meter. Okay, so we abandoned the exercise. Everyone you know, has no questions? Everybody understood the exercise? Okay. But remember that that I told you, maybe you don't have to put these extra things, you don't have to put it on paper, you don't have to deliver it. But all the time think about extra things that you can do with the exercise or how can you expand it further or even to question the assumptions or the things that are written in the exercise. Okay, if I'm putting one value, you say, is that a reasonable assumption or not? Okay, uh, so I want to now to start the, to have a small discussion on another way to capture uncertainty, okay? Another way for decision making. Called decision tree. And that's a tool that many project managers, maybe a lot of engineers are using to take decisions. And they are say they are using this tool, a decision tree, to also to account for uncertainty. And it's a different way to account for uncertainty um, than the one that we discussed before. So first, you have to do a decision. You have to actually to draw a tree, depending on the variables that you have. So let's say that you can have, um, let's say that you can have, um, okay, uh, one thing before that. That we also remember that all the time we're drawing the, okay, so now I'm close here, don't be confused. So I'm the probabilistic distribution okay. we are using it continuous. Okay, you have certain variable, for example porosity, and you're saying that it's continuous. But actually sometimes you need to use it discrete. Okay, you need to have actually three values of porosity or four values of porosity and you have to assign to each one of them a probability of occurrence. So how do we do that? Any idea? If we want to split, for example, we want to convert this curve that is continuous of probability distribution of porosity. Now we want to change it to something like this. It's the same example that you saw with, uh, with Golan, okay? That you had certain, I think he was doing an example on workers and the number of days that were, they were going to work. So for that case, for example, you say split the porosity in three intervals, and you here you take just this value, and then you take, for example, you don't take the maximum, but you take, you divide in three the interval of porosity, porosity max, porosity mean. Okay. So it will be max minus mean divided by the number of divisions that I'm going to have is three. And then I take the first value will be this divided by two, okay? Because we want the value that is exactly at the center. The value that is here, this is this value, okay? This is also the same value, but the value that is exactly in the center is this one, right? And then you have to add this delta t for the next values, for this one in the center and this one. And the probability, you just add them up, okay, of occurrence. 
you make the integral in our case we have to make the integral of all of this area that is below the graph and this will be the probability that we have to assign to that process then we do another integral of all of this area that we have here and that's the value that we assign to this number okay so something very important sometimes that you will see now exactly for the decision tree we need to have only one value or we have to have a set of discrete values so let's do very quickly and then we take a break uh, an example to we are going to have C, we have different scenarios, okay? We can have an oil price, different oil prices. And we have, for example, let's say $20 per barrel or $10 per barrel. And the probability that 20 will occur is, let's say, very likely. So we say it's 70%. And the probability that 10, it will drop below 10. Then mm -hmm. let's say it's uh, 30%. So we have here the value. And probability. And let's take another parameter, for example, um, cost. Okay, the total cost. We are, we are at an early stage, we are at this stage, so we don't have much information how much it's going to cost. We only have approximate information. We even haven't gone to the vendors to ask for information how much that's going to cost. So let's say that we have three uh, costs. Let's say it can cost, um, let's put it in billions maybe. Uh, again, 20 billions, okay, US dollars. So we have again uh, 25, or sorry, 35 or 45. Okay, and we assign certain probability to these events. If we have, uh, for example, we have a very good knowledge about this number, we say, okay, there is 80% probability that this value will occur. Or here, let's say, it might be that this value also may be 15% and this only 5% that this scenario will, will occur. Cost of, let's say, facilities. And then let's put another parameter because it, it otherwise it will be very big, the tree that we are going to build. So what the last one will be this total recoverable reserves. Okay, We have to compound all of that diagram that we calculated before. We have to compound it with discrete values, maybe in three options. Okay, So we say we can have a reservoir of 20 million barrels. Okay, That, let's say, has a probability very small. We do the same thing that I explained here. Very small of 20%. Then we have a reservoir of, I don't know, 50 million. That one has a more likely probability of 50%. Okay. And then we have uh, one of maybe 60. And that has a probability of the rest. So that's 0.3, 30%. Then we make our tree. These are all the variables, and as you see, none of them we have really a decision. Okay, we cannot decide on any of these variables. We cannot decide on the oil price. We cannot really decide on the reserves. Okay, we cannot decide of how much it's going to cost at this point in time. We are in an early phase. We don't know much about it. So all of them are chance. Okay, chance uh, decisions. So let's say let's start with the price. So to put a a, a chance note, you have to use is a circle. Is a mm -hmm. chance note. Square is a decision node, something that the user is deciding what to. Any any of any of you were using these trees before, decision trees. You, okay. Did before you see it here at the antenna? Before this, we saw it here in the last Okay. And end node, it's uh, like this. Okay. So to build the tree, let's start with the price. Okay, so we have initially one chance node that the price might be, and in the price we have only two options. Okay, and we can put here how what is the probability of each option that the barrel will be greater than twenty dollars or that the value will be greater than ten. Okay. So that's on the price, okay. and this option is for uh, twenty, and this is for ten. US dollars per barrel. Okay. 
then at this point we have another chance okay we have if any of these two scenarios are selected then we have another chance we have a chance that oil price we have a chance that the facilities for example will cost and here we have three values okay 20 35 and 45 20 35 and 45 and each one of them, remember that in any chance node, all the summation of all the probabilities have to give you one. Okay. I cannot have a, an error there. So one of them, 20 was uh, 0.8. Then you have uh, 0.15 and 0.5. And I have to have the same exactly for this other node. So maybe I have to lower it because I won't have enough space. Ah, 0 0.5, yeah. And again, you have the same thing. Let's copy that. Quite cool. You have to do it. You have to also to get a tablet. Well, not so cool then. Still have to do some homework. And here we had the last one that was 0 0.05. And then, for each one of them, we have 10 different possible uh, recoverable reserves, uh, three, sorry, okay? So we have, again, we have here a chance node, and we have three. Here we have another chance node, and we have another three, another chance node, and here we have another three. And the idea of these three is just to tell you, at the end of each one, each one of them, you have so let me just pull the, I have already messed up enough, so you can have the final picture. Okay, and so that's what more or less what I was explaining, okay? Oil price and then investment and then reserves that you have. And then for each one of these options, for each one of the final nodes, these are going to be end nodes, so I have to put them like this. That that's at the end. I don't have any more decision decisions to make there. Or not decisions, but chance. So then for each one of these cases, I can compute I can compute the probability, the total probability. So what is that? Any of you has an idea? Just a multiplication of all the probabilities, okay? So for example, if I want the probability, total probability of this case, I have to multiply the first 0 0.70 times 0 0.30 times 0 0.2, okay? And then that's how I get this number. Then I have to multiply for the second one, this times this times this, and so forth. So I get the probability that each case, well, from all of these 18 cases will occur. Hmm? And then I have that I do deterministically. I go, and that's a big job, okay? I have to calculate for each one of these options what will be my MPV. For that, I have a, already a system in place, a computer routine or something, that I just change the input of these values, and then I obtain different MPVs for all of these projects. And then I compute. Then that doesn't tell me much, okay? That tells me, for example, that I can have a very successful project with 60, but that's only if all of this happens. But I can have also a very bad project of minus 20, minus 27, if all of this happens. A okay, very low oil price, that apparently I have to invest a lot more than what I thought, and then you know maybe I didn't have as much as I, th as I thought, okay? So this is a way to tell you, so there is a way to say, to put a value on all of these three, to put a value of on, on all of these uh, option that I have to invest, okay? If you're the company and you say, I want to invest in all of these, in it, all of this could happen in one scenario that I'm evaluating right now. So how can I assign one single value to this project? Okay, so the idea is that you multiply the NPV times the probability, and then you sum all of them up. So it's kind of an NPV weighted average with the probability, with each probability. And that gives you the final number, and this is the number that the whole project <coughs> could have, the, po the potential NPV that that project could give you. And then with this value, you see if it's worth or not to make the investment. 
or to continue with that, continue evaluating that project. Okay. And you can also do with these values, you can also do your probabilis probability distribution function. And you can see what is the most likely value that you will have. Here is NPV okay, versus probability. And you can have also the cumulative distribution that tells you also cumulative distribution function for NPV using all of those cases that you are calculating. So in that way, that's another way to capture uncertainty when you have to make decisions, okay? Or when you have chance also. In this case, we are only, the, we, you see we have only chance nodes, but also I can take an example, okay? And you can do exactly the same thing. You have the option, and that's taken from the paper uh, of, that I put on its learning. You have the option to either explore or not on that, and then you have the option that there will be a discovery on the well that you're drilling, 10%, very, very, very little, or that, that it will be dry. So in that case, there will be no value, or there will be a negative NPV for that option. And if you make a discovery, you have a high option that you have using the other plot that we calculated last Monday, 20% that it will be very high, 40% that that's more or less what you expected, 20% or 20% non-commercial. And with all of that, you can calculate the weight average NPV and you can decide with this value if it's worth, if the risk and the uncertainty that you have in this problem, in this uh, project, is worth to continue or not, or to stop and abandon it. Okay, so let's take a break now. Uh, we can say 10 minutes, and then we come back for the second part of the lecture. Okay, so we return. Okay, so now you have seen uh, some tools, okay, I bas basically I will call them tools, okay, because um, one is the Monte Carlo simulation to, to, to deal with uncertainty, and really this method you can use it for anything. Here we have done the example on total recoverable reserves, but uh, but really can be applied for, a, uh, of course, for NPV, for any other kind of calculations. And we saw the decision tree, that is when you have a lot of uncertainty, you are at the very early stage and you have to take a decision. There is a lot of chance in the project, so you can actually discretize this uncertainty and then you can see or evaluate for the whole project what might be the expected NPV, okay? The weight average probability, weight average NPV. And from there, you want to make a decision if to embark on that project or just abandon and go away, run away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I want now to... Uh, uh, the last part of this lecture is going to be about cost, okay, about uh, the economic calculations, economic Let's look a bit at the at a more general level. What is of uh, let's say that we have a company an oil company called NTNU oil Inc And initially, where is the money coming from for this company? To, for example, this company wants to make a development or is going to building a field. So where is the money going to come from? First, it's going to come also from the same company, maybe some other assets that are giving revenue that it can use. But a uh, big part comes from loans, okay? Loans, banks. that is pouring money into this oil company. Then another part is coming, if we are saying that this is a, a, a company, a public company, okay, that it has shares, it's not, it's not a owned by the state, and it has shares that it can be bought by the public, so this comes from the shares. Maybe some people are investing here, so this comes from pension funds. Okay, bonds. By the way, is the statue a private or a public company? Huh? It's private. So that you can buy, if I want, I can go and buy shares from Statoil. If I want. Yeah. Okay. Sure about it? Okay. So the the main the main expenses, let's say that this company is starting or a starting a project. So what are the main expenses or the main uh, cash payments that this company has to make. 
So one of them is called Drillex, okay, drilling expenditures. In this case, the term, maybe that's already known for all of you, but X is for expenditures. It's not for the XY for anything, it's just expenditures, okay. And this have to do with, uh, so how, how do we calculate Drillex? Come on, from your drilling courses. Hmm? So we have rig rental, okay, the daily rig, daily rig uh, fee or daily rig, yeah, we can call it fee. So we have, of course, um, services. We have equipment that we are going to put on the well. What else? We can leave it for now, that complexity, it's okay. So we have, again, we have another cash sink that we have is CAPEX. And in CAPEX, what kind of things do we have? We have actually the facilities, processing facilities. So let's put here a minus because that's coming out of the company. Here we have also a big part also is engineering, design and engineering. No, you have to design what we are doing here, okay? You are going to, you know, be done with this course in June. They are going to hire you, so they have to pay your salary. They have to pay your hours that you're doing this Monte Carlo simulation and your your uh, reservoir simulation, etc. So that's design and engineering. So we have, what else? Um, we have also all the parts of the subsea system that are not the wells. For example, all the manifolds. Uh, we need maybe uh, some boosting equipment. What else can you think of? That is inside CAPEX. Pipelines. Hmm? Pipelines. Pipelines. Okay, and we can leave it like that. So you got the, the point. So then, what else do we have? Okay, another cash sink is called the OPEX, okay, operational expenditures. So we are getting a lot of negative things here. It's only spending money, it's not making money. So here we have, uh, for example, the, um, the salary of the personnel. We have the power energy consumption. Okay. We have uh, maintenance that we have to make. We have to maybe replace some equipment. Place some equipment. Uh, we also have uh, services. Services like what? Stimulation. Stimulation, but I will say, for example, if we are injecting something in the wells, okay, injecting any chemicals, so injection, okay, water injection, for example, we have to treat the water and then re inject it. So we have, again, we have water, or uh, we can call it disposal, disposal of streams. Okay, that will be uh, water treatment. Uh, if we have some CO2 reinjection, what else? What about PLC simulation? That also comes into into. Okay. 
Yeah, now I don't have space, so I have to go down. Oh, I have. Okay, what else I have here? Only negative things. So there was one thing that he was um, uh, Eter Madar, the the uh, engineer from Sevan. He was saying, do you remember any other term? Also finishing ending with uh, Bex, X, Abex. Okay, abandonment. That's also a cost that usually has to be taken into account. That is to abandon, aban plug and abandon the wells. And you have here also the decommissioning. If you have a structure, uh, an offshore platform, you have to decommission it and have to put it the way it was when you came initially. So decommissioning of equipment. Etc. 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 So that's also a cash sink. Now, what could be the the? So where are the revenues coming from? All of so far, is that's like a black hole. It's taking all of our money of uh, this anti new company. Hmm? Okay, that's very important. I was forgetting that. So you have another tax sink that is tax and royalties. I uploaded uh, a document. Uh, that is on its learning that you can have a, a look. It's uh, under, let's see, resources. I think it have been reading material. No, it's not there. Oil and gas taxation in Norway. So you can read a bit. It's a very short document, only I think 10 pages, 10 to 12 pages. But it gives you an overview how the oil is, oil and gas are taxated in Norway. Okay, so those are, I know that there is a separate course. How many of you are taking this petroleum economics? Three, okay. So those, no need to repeat. I guess you covered this in detail in that course, I guess. Yeah? Few things? Not yet? But is he supposed to talk about tax? Yeah, okay. So you can tell us the stories when you come back from the lecture, how what they are doing there. Okay, so tax and royalties and every, uh, every, um, Every country has a different scheme. You have to pay also uh, the share of the partners if you have any partner in the same uh, in the same development. But depending on this, I think in Norway, uh, do you know the numbers? I think it's something like 27% special tax and 20 something percent that's oil tax. And then you have another tax that is a special tax. I can put the values a bit better later when I get exactly the figure. Or we can open the document to see. Okay, tax rate at 27%. Maybe it's not big for you enough. Okay, 27% and an additional special tax of 51%. So actually the number was the opposite, 51 and 27. But all of that is counterbalance. You see that is very important. Everything that we are expending in this uh, in this pr uh, project, but all of that is counterbalanced by the revenues that we are getting. And the revenues are mainly coming from the sales of oil and gas and associated products. So here we have a big is you know it's only one, but it's a very big plus. That is um, revenues. And revenues. Sales of oil, gas. Maybe we have condensate production. We have condensate. Maybe we have also uh, LNG, LPG, etc. Can these revenues really count? They really take the scale to to the to the positive side. But after that, after we have all deducted, we have deducted all the things that we have to pay, all the opex. So we end up with some revenue. Okay, we end up with some cash flow. We can sum all of that. We can say summation of. 
So we can define a, actually uh, uh, an indicator called uh, cash flow. Cash flow. That is just going to be equal to the revenues minus the expenses. Or in another words, just the revenues minus Drillex, CapEx, minus OPEX, minus the tax. Okay. <coughs> and of course, initially in the project, so let me just pull the picture. I think I showed that before to you, but so you have a nice picture in the We have uh, initially we don't have actually any revenue because we haven't begun to produce the field so we have only expenditures in capex we have expenditures in relax but then after we begin to produce we begin to get revenues and also we have to begin to pay our tax we have to pay um, uh, yeah we have to pay our operate operational expenditures but one important thing is that this revenue goes this cash flow at the end when I have a revenue when it's positive goes to if you remember what we had initially at the top of the figure okay we have to pay we took some loans to do this project we took some uh, commitments financial commitments so it has to go back to paying those financial uh, financial obligations to also to pay the shareholders okay, and all the people investing in the shares of the company and some part also goes to reinvestment for some other projects that uh, that company might be pursuing at the moment. Okay. <coughs> now, um, so we have talked about the expenses, we have talked about where the money more or less, that's very simplified, okay, but that's how the money more or less flows in the company. And usually this profile is very important. That's the cash flow, but usually it's not, in, it's not, so, uh, it's not so nice to have just because the, num the numbers that you see here in this plot are usually we can make, um, make it like that. Usually the analysis is made uh, by the end of the year. Okay, that's what is typically done in the fiscal uh, by the in the fiscal system. Analysis by the end of the year. So we can do if we think all the time we're thinking about how to put it in Excel. So we have time in years or we can just call it end of year instead of years end of year and we have the end of year zero uh, here we won't have anything the project hasn't started yet but we have one two three four end of year one and so forth and here I began to put my expenses, okay? So I have to put Relex, CapEx, OPEX. Then I have my revenues. Let's put it like that. And tax. And here I can calculate my cash flow. That is just what the formula that I mentioned before, all the revenues minus all the expenses. But this number per se, that number is given in amount of 
dollars or amount of kroners that I will spend by that year. So if we want to make really a, a meaningful analysis, we have to use the present value. All of you here know what the present value is? Yeah? Yes? yes? Okay. So we have to use the present value. And we just take that. I think I have here a definition. That we want to know at one particular point in time, usually it's at the beginning of the project, or usually it's when I'm doing the economical evaluation. Let's say we are evaluating now the field, but I know that in the future I will have an expense of certain millions, a number of million of dollars, okay? So I want to translate that money to the value of millions that I will have today, okay? And for that I use the present value, and I think you have a formula that is, um, so you have the present value, is equal to the value that you have in the future. So we can call that um, future value. One plus I to the number of years. Okay, that's number of years in the future. And this is the yearly interest rate. Because it's not the same to have one million knock to have to pay it 10 years from now than to have to pay them now. One million now is much wor worse. The, the value is much more than the ones that you pay in the future. So with this equation, you can convert the cash flow in the cash flow in the present value of the cash flow. Okay? Just by using that equation and multiplying this cell by one over one plus i to the n. Okay. And that's how you obtain this nice plot that I, I'm going to show you a particular case for Bison. That was one example that the students were doing to, where is it? Okay, the, the students were doing, I think, two years ago. And this period really changes with the, uh, with first in offshore, you know, in offshore projects, this expenditure is very much pronounced, okay? But uh, you can read that from the paper of, uh, if you go to the reading references, uh, where are they? Reading material, okay, you have, I, I recommend you, I think I put it on its learning to read these two references, okay? If you read this paper, is uh, I think, to my opinion, is very good, and it gives you a good overview of the whole how are the planning and the economical part of the field development. Okay, so I took actually that figure from there, and you see that for uh, for an offshore for an offshore project, the expenditure part is much more pronounced. Okay, it's much more pronounced that for an odds for a. that for an offshore project, okay? It's much more pronounced. And really these values, some companies, they depend on the, on, the, on the attitude of the company. Some companies prefer to spend a lot of money, so this one will be even deeper. But to have a begin producing or begin having revenues much sooner in the life of the field. Some other companies prefer to delay the pain and to invest uh, less, but in a longer period of time and beginning having revenues at the end. That also depends on the strategy, what are other projects you have that you're producing simultaneously at the same time, and where are they supposed to enter into, into production. It will affect the total MPV, but some people prefer, let's say if they want to commission everything at the same time, and they want to have it everything ready by this date because they have a goal to begin producing at some, some time, okay? They don't want to delay this process, for example, for six years, they want to have it in four years. If you want it quick, you have to pay much more. But depends, for example, I think Petrobras is working with this kind of approach, okay? That they want, they prefer to invest a lot of money initially to get things done quickly, but then they enter into production. What happens with the offshore projects is that you can begin producing, you put 
things in place and you can begin producing already having revenue much earlier. And then you use the revenue that you're getting from the existing wells to drill the extra wells that you have to put. It's much easier to hook up the system, to put, on, to put new wells, to add new wells into the production system than in a subsea system. Usually in a subsea system we try to, we begin producing with as many wells as possible. Okay. Only a few will remain. Uh, okay, so here we're missing one thing in our table that you can have the, we can put it small again. I'm going to move it again to the right. So we have one thing that I guess you already know is the NPV. We can call it cumulative NPV. That is, in this case, will be just this number. But now in this cell, it will be this number plus this number, these two. Now this again will be this plus the one from before. Okay. And at the end, you find a cumulative, an NPV that characterizes the project. And that's the number that we want to use, for example, in our decision calculation that I was showing before. That's where the number is coming from. Okay. The total NPV. We can put a picture also from the same paper. of the NPV. And if you see here something very curious that is in relationship with the question that I had before at the beginning of the class, that you see you have the same curve but you have three colors. You have one high case, base case, and low case. What that could be? What do you think? Okay, That depends on the oil price that they are using for their calculations. Okay, At the end they will have that they have used for example $20 per barrel Okay, and they give you some MPV1, then they use 30, and that gives them one MPV2 and 40, and that gives them an MPV3. Okay, and it gives them a different cash, cash distribution, cash flow distribution in your, in your whole project. Okay. Uh, so how can we, one question, so if we do that analysis, okay, we repeat that calculation, we have Excel, okay, so we can just change the input very quickly. We can put the oil price like a fixed price, we can put the distribution, or we can change that very quickly if we program properly our Excel sheet, okay? So how can we reflect how important is, for example, the oil price in the NPV? For that, it's usually an, another tool, a spider plot. Any of you heard of it? No? Okay, yes? Tornado, yeah, uh, well, similar to tornado, spider plot that is using the principle of uh, Ceteris Paribus. You can search for that on the internet. But basically is that if you want to study something that depends on too many variables, we try to first fix all the variables as possible to keep them constant, and then we make variation on only one variable and see what is the outcome, okay? Then we leave that one fixed, we begin to change another one, and we see what is the outcome. Okay. So in this kind of plot, you have uh, a y-axis that has, for example, the value of the variable that you want to analyze. Okay. In our case, for example, will be MPV. And we want, it might be a lot of change, for example, orders of magnitude on the MPV. If you change, for example, the cost from 10 to $50, do $50 then you can have an order of magnitude of one change, one change in the order of magnitude. So what you want to do is you want to say that I want to put y minus to normalize y of the base divided by y of the base times 100. Okay. And the base is with no variation. You, for example, choose 30 barrels, like the value, like the base case. Okay. For example, $30 per barrel. And this variation, then it goes from, for example, 100% to minus 100% variation. Okay. And here you have the, uh, the variation in the parameter that you want to analyze. Okay. In this case, we want to analyze what happens with the oil price. And the oil price, also, we have to do the same thing. So in this case, goes x. That's the parameter that we want to change. Okay. 
and we have x minus x of the base that we can assume that our base case is the most likely for example oil price that the company is expecting that let's say that is thirty dollars per bar okay and we are assuming a change of plus let's say hundred percent that will be sixty dollars per barrel or minus hundred percent that will be how much zero no we cannot put zero so we say um, is how much? 10%? Okay, with let's say 50%, so it will be $15 per barrel. Okay. And then you plot for each one of them, for example, for this value, what will be the, the NPV? Okay. Of course, when you have a higher value, you will get a higher NPV. Okay. When you have the medium, maybe your NPV is here. And then when you have a lower, then it's here. And that tells you the sensitivity that that parameter has that the, that the MPV has with that parameter okay. and you can repeat that kind of analysis with some other variables okay like I think we have an example here okay that's also from one exercise that you will have to make okay, and here we have included oil price gas price, uh, drill X, and the discount rate, okay? That's, you see, in this case, the discount rate is the one that has the most impact. If I, I increase the discount rate by 40%, or if I decrease it by minus 40%, it has a huge impact on the NPV. All of you know how to make this plot? Is it clear? Yes, no, we are awake, no, we are sleepy, we want to go home. Huh? That clear for all of you? No? So okay, so how do you make the, the plot? You first say, you have to define your, your parameter, okay? You have your x parameter and you have the minimum, x minimum, x in the base, and x in the maximum. Okay, and let's say that that's the price of the You have X1, that can, might be the oil price. You have X2, that might be, um, uh, what do we have here? Gas price. Okay, so remember that the principle is that you're going to make variations on one variable without affecting the others. So let's say you want to make this variation so here x2 will be x2 base. And with all the rest, no matter how many you have, all of the others will be base. Okay, all of them will be in the base case. And from that you can compute, using your Excel sheet, you can compute an NPV of the project, a total NPV. And this is going to be NPV min, NPV base, and NPV max. Now in order to plot it, because we want, you say, I told you the order of magnitude, if we are going to put on the same axis uh, the oil price, let's say it will be from 30 to 60, okay? But the drill X might be from, I don't know, 1 billion to 3 billion, okay? So the scales are different. So that's why I'm telling you that you have to normalize, okay? So if you put it in percentage, that's hiding the real value of the variable, but this is still reflecting how much is affecting the NPV. So you, then you do the normalization so you put uh, x normalized, okay, and y normalized with the equation that I showed you before, and this is the the this is going to be these three points that you're going to plot. For the oil price is this point, this point, and this point, and they are in the same color in the same series because it's only variation in the oil price, right? Now you repeat again with the other factor. Now you want to see, for example, what happens with the gas price. So the oil price, we leave it at the minimum, at the, sorry, at the base. But now you change the gas price to X2 max, X2 base, and X2 min. And all the rest remain in base. Then you find an NPV max, NPV min, and NPV Sorry, base and min. Okay. 
and you again compute your normalized values and you plot that series that will be variation with gas price and you plot that series here and of course you begin to see that you have a common point in these two series you have this point is the same as in this series so these two you actually don't have to do any calculation but that point is the same because it's using the same base value right okay so that's what's called uh, it's a very sim simplistic way but also it's very important because it tells you what is the most important parameter in your project okay if it's the oil price if it's the drill X or where you have to invest your money or what could be a possible blocker in your project of course just to make one more one last comment here on the NPV you can also include and that's also that's usually done you can also include uncertainty in this calculation okay you have like uh, what uh, uh, it, uh, Mahmoud was explaining last Thursday you have in each value capex and opex you have a distribution okay I think he said plus minus hundred percent so capex can be from you have certain value but you are not sure and there might be a minimum and a maximum and you can also do a Monte Carlo simulation with that okay and then you can get instead of getting a spider diagram you just get a, a probability distribution for NPV an accumulative distribution function for NPV but we are not going to go that complex in this uh, in this co in this course but just to make you aware that that exists so now before before we finish uh, some other tool that you will need to use is the Gantt chart okay all of you familiar with the Gantt chart yeah how many of you are familiar with the Gantt chart two three okay okay it's a chart that we can use to uh, to track okay to track our project or to see a kind of a visual representation of our project and here we can put the main activities what's going to happen here I have to deliver a report I have to prepare a report that's going to take so many hours or so many days then uh, I have to deliver the plan for development and operations then I have to begin to lay the pipeline then I have to begin doing the engineering and doing grading and completion okay so this diagram is very important and actually was invented by this guy Henry Gant very serious fellow And, uh, and of course, that's a very important tool for project managers, okay? You have to be aware that they exist. You may be one even to use it for, I don't know, if your master thesis or your project, but this is kind of the prayer that every project manager makes to Gantt, okay? Because he's so great, so we look at the sky and say, thank you, Gantt, for giving us this wonderful tool for that we could use, okay? Uh, and I think, I, in the exercise, I made a, a small section just if you want to put the Gantt diagram for the for the development options. So I'm not going to cover here how to plot Gantt charts, but I recommend you just give you this reference. I think it's good what they explain here and it's basic enough, so you can go and check it yourself and see how you can plot the the Gantt chart on on Excel. How you can make a Gantt chart, but basically you have to put. Uh, you have to use a code for the activity, activity code. Then you have the name of the activity because the code is just a ver better way to put it in the plot, okay? But then you have to put the name, then you have to have the start, okay? That you could use a date or if you're using it in weeks, you say at week zero, that's where it's going to start or week one. Then you have to put the duration and then you have to put the, the end. So let's say that activity, let's say design of or calculation of total recoverable reserves, that's going to take two weeks, and at the end we will finish in uh, week three. Okay, one, two, and three. And then you have to have another activity, A, another activity B, that that starts, for example, that's week two, and that finishes at five, and that finishes at week seven, for example. And when you have populated that table, it's possible that you can create, you look, go into this address and you see how to create the Gantt diagram. Very important and also to see, to plan, one very important application of that is to see our resources that we will have to invest and plan when do we have to have these resources available. Okay, so we are just about to, uh, just to summarize. Any questions? 
before we finish. No? So yes, yeah. About this farm trade. Hmm? Uh, this farm trade, is it market based or is it for every company to take it? Which one? Yeah. Uh, then the calculation you can do. Yeah. Uh, they make this farm trade, right? Mm -hmm. That comes usually from the financial institution of the country. Okay, they might take different values, but usually we they take from the financial indicator of the country, <coughs> for example. Okay. And for the same project, every company has different MPV calculations, right? Uh, you have if you have different development alternatives, you will have different NPVs. Each one of them, you have to do the calculation to calculate its MPV. And for the same development. Mm -hmm. No, you have, well, that, that usually, remember, usually the company doesn't go alone in a project, okay? They go with some partners. So usually the planning and the development, that's done by the operating company. So all the partners, they can do their calculations and they can try to give some input. But really the one that takes the decision is the operating company. And MPVs updated or it just gets updated? That gets updated every time that you, uh, that, that you have more information about the reservoir. But to take a decision, you have initially one value. You do your evaluation, calculate multiple alternatives, see which one gives you the best NPV, and then you take a decision. And then the result might be something completely different. But at least to take the, your decision about how to develop the field, that's, that's a fixed number after that comes out of this analysis. Okay? So we have seen today some things that are a bit boring. Okay? I think you're sleepy and want to go home. But these are very important tools for doing uh, field development studies, okay? So first we have seen how to take into account uncertainty, that we is not enough to make deterministic calculations, but we have to do probabilistic calculations. And for that, really, the best tool and the tool that is accepted and the tool that everybody is using is Monte Carlo simulation, okay? And they use it. It can be used for NPV calculation or it can be used for total recoverable reserves, etc. Then we saw... Um, then we, um, we talked about another tool that was important. Uh, well, we talked about that, but that was uh, said the last class, okay, about how we can put some variables that are not quantitati quantitative to something quantitative. How can we assign a number to these decision parameters? Uh, then uh, we talked about another tool that has to do with decision and has to, uh, has to do with uh, chance, okay? That is the probability tree. And there, as Bilal said, there are commercial programs that you could use. You put the different scenarios, and that's going to calculate it automatically for you. But remember, there is a calculation involved here. For each one of these, for each one of these cases, you have to have an NPV value. So that value has to come someplace. So you have to have either a, a Excel sheet that you can change very quickly and calculate your NPV, or you have to do it manually for each one of the cases. But this is a very powerful tool that allows you to tell you, to give you an idea if you should go and invest in this project or not. Uh, some other thing that we saw that may be repetition for you, but uh, we, s we talked about uh, the cash flow in an oil company and in the different phases. We said initially you have to do a lot of expenses, you have to pay a lot of things, drill ex capex, to uh, just to get the system installed and still you don't get any revenue but later in the life of the field you begin to have a lot of revenue but then you have operational expenditures and you have to pay to um, to back to the partners you have to pay back to loans you have to pay back to the investors okay and we saw that a very important number there is how to calculate the present value of the cash flow or they call it also the discounted cash flow that is all that refer to the same reference because it's not the same the value of the mo of the money is different in time and at the end the only the unique value that we want to use is the NPV to assign a value to a project okay to see how uh, profitable it is or not and finally we talked about well before we talked about uh, this spider plot that is very useful to see which one is the most important or the most relevant relevant value and this could be used for anything okay I'm using here the example of NPV but you could have used the same example for total recoverable reserves. Using the same equation, you define a maximum and minimum and uh, base, and then you compute and you make this plot. Okay, and it, but of course it gives you limited information because you're assuming that all the rest remain uh, constant. And at the end, we talked a bit, or just very briefly, about the Gantt chart. That is, I think is very important. I think in the next exercise, we'll have a small section on that. 
using for managing the project and see when each phase is going to start and I just tell you that you have to please go to this address and try to read the instructions how to do it in Excel and try it for yourself before you do the exercise okay so we close for today thank you for Thank you.